and we are recording. So welcome. I'd like to thank all of our members uh, of the society uh, who've supported the organization through what has, of course, been a tough year. Um, and your continued support is really valued and appreciated. Um, I should remind you that we're just holding our first election for board of directors, uh, first ever, I should say, in, in 20 years via online process rather than a live meeting. And I know most of you uh, have seen your email and gotten the ballot and it'd be greatly appreciated if you return your ballot with your votes. Uh, there are six individuals running as directors and there are six seats. So it'll work out quite nicely and we have uh, three new faces that are coming on the board. We'll tell you more about that at our membership meeting next month. Um, but if you can get your ballot back in online or print it out and mail it in, uh, we'd like to get it back by this coming Monday. Um, clearly, uh, we on the board have been working hard to sort of catch up uh, after sort of losing our way a little bit at the start of last year um, when the pandemic hit. Well, how soon can we open? How soon should we plan to get up to speed with webinars and so forth? but we are up and running well now. And we have a number of great lectures planned for this spring 2021 season. You'll receive emails and links to the lectures uh, if you're a member or on our mailing list uh, from membership coordinator, Marian Slinger. Um, you can also check our website for the latest uh, in our forthcoming programs. And the spring issue of our newsletter, Magpie, Call, Magpie Calls, will be sent out next week. And that'll have all of the lineup for the spring uh, lectures. Um, Again, as a reminder, uh, you can send in your questions for Dr. Schaefer at any time during his talk and, and Margie will be monitoring those. And uh, so uh, keep, keep those good ideas going and because Q&A is so important often in these programs, we learn a lot um, after a lecture when we have time to discuss these things with Dr. Schaefer is a part I'm always looking forward to. So um, I just wanna say before I do my formal introduction of Dr. Schaefer, the photo that I'm using as my backdrop uh, this time is mm -hmm. one that I thought might be appropriate. I'm up on the foothills of the San Rafael mountain range and I'm looking west, oh, almost directly over my head and shoulder is the Los Alamos Valley and they're the La Prisma and Solomon Hills. And I said, well, of all my photos, this is kind of a nice overview of what we will call tiger salamander country. And uh, this is uh, probably, you can't quite see Dr. Schaefer's research site, but it's, it's back there um, in this photo. So, and as, as a special a treat to have him here tonight, um, as you know, from the announcement we sent out, he was one of two speakers at our inaugural meeting for the public on our poster, which you'll see, um, become a charter member. And he gave a wonderful lecture along with Dr. Sam Sweet and we had live tiger salamanders, something that, of course, we'd love to do again someday. Um, so it's been 21 years, and it, it's hard to believe uh, he's back and, and brought a lot of new research with him to share tonight. Brad Shaper is a distinguished professor in ecology and evolutionary biology at UCLA. He was an undergraduate major in zoology at UCSB and UC Berkeley. He received his PhD at the University of Chicago where he worked on Mexican tiger salamanders. And he joined the University of California system in 1985. As you recall, when he lectured here uh, 21 years ago, he was affiliated with uh, and a professor at UC Davis. A lifelong herpetologist, Brad has studied tiger salamanders and their relatives across the US and Mexico for four decades. So aren't we lucky to have him tonight and much appreciated that he made the time after spending a lot of the day on Zoom, probably teaching graduate and undergraduate students. He's the founding director of the UCLA, UCLA La Crete Center for California Conservation Science, the UCLA Stunt Ranch Re Natural Reserve, and he is head of this California Conservation Genomics Project, which was recently funded to use geno genomic analysis of over 200 plants and animals to revamp conservation efforts in the state. And wow, that's a whole nother lecture I'm gonna ask that we might consider in the future. This is very exciting and cutting edge stuff. So please everyone um, give a big virtual welcome to Dr. Bradley Schaefer. Okay, John, am I on? 
you're on and I'm I am on. Okay. Well, first of all, uh, John and Marjorie, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for, thanks for having me. And, um, you know, it's, it's really pretty fun to be back after 20 plus years. And, uh, the fact of the matter is, is that I studied tiger salamanders then. I study tiger salamanders now. I've always been sort of oddly infatuated with reptiles and amphibians in general. And since my graduate school days started back in 19, in the late 1970s, um, I've always worked on tiger salamanders as well as other things like the beautiful Western pond turtle behind me in my, uh, <clears throat> in my, my background. Um, Anyhow, what I'd like to do is sort of dive right in because I have a bunch of stuff I want to talk to you about. As, as John said, we have made a tremendous amount of prog progress in our understanding of tiger salamanders generally in the state of California and across the continent in Mexico. Um, and in particular, in the last oh, nine years um, since I moved to UCLA and really, really ramped up my work um, on the Santa Barbara distinct population segment of tiger salamanders. And I just want to share some of that, those, those data, that information, and the insights that we've gotten with you. So I'm going to go to screen share, and I'm going to... You know what I'm going to do is I'm going to really wait just a moment here. And um, you just know I'm going to share the wrong one. And it's going to be something embarrassing and horrible. Nope, there it is. Um, OK, so let's do that. And hopefully. Can you see that, John? I can't. I can see your screen share, yeah. Can you see my, um... there we go. Okay, can you all see that? Yes. Okay, great. I've just so, turned the videos off for the two of us so they don't have to look at us. Okay, fantastic, thanks. Um, <clears throat> and so what I'm gonna do is talk to you, as the title says, about tiger salamanders in Santa Barbara County, what we've learned and future prospects. And this is a really a joint talk um, with, between myself and Aaron Toffelmeyer. Aaron uh, received her PhD in my lab at UCLA and is now the Associate Director of that, that California Conservation Genomics Project. But she's done a lot of the heavy lifting, especially on some of the genetics work in Santa Barbara County. And what I'm kind of hoping is, is at the end, if Aaron is on and can stay awake through this, that uh, when it comes to the Q&A, perhaps we can both participate in that. So um, let's, let's dive into it and, oops, and uh, see how we do. Okay, that didn't work. Let's see if this works. Yeah, there we go. So there's, uh, John just sent me this and it's just pretty fun to see a, uh, poster from 20 years, nearly you know, 20 years ago or 20 years ago, yeah. Um, on that first inaugural talk that Sam and I gave, um, Sam, as you know, still goes out and collects tiger salamanders and works on them from UCSB. And I certainly still work on them, although I'm not at UC Davis anymore. Um, and that inaugural meeting, uh, which my my colleague and friend, uh, Dick Sage, who uh, has always been a big supporter of my work on tiger salamanders, um, uh, sort of introduced me to the group and, um, and we've been working on it ever since. So what I wanna do is um, first tell you just a, just, just a little quick review on the biology of tiger salamanders. And what I'm trying to do in this talk as I move through different pieces of it is there, there are kind of key people who have been really important in <clears throat> my work on California tiger salamanders. And so I just want to introduce them as we go along. So this is Chris Searcy. He received his PhD with me back up in Davis and then did a postdoc with me. He's now an assistant professor at the University of Miami. <clears throat> and um, he's been a very integral part of a lot of the ecological work um, it, that, that I'll be talking about today. So there's a tiger salamander. There's a California tiger salamander. And 
as John sort of mentioned, tiger salamanders are distributed across all of the United States. They're, they're absent from the Appalachian Mountains and parts of the East Coast, but otherwise they're, they're pretty ubiquitous across the country and down through Mexico, through about the level of Mexico City. Um, what's, what's sort of very special about them here is that our tiger salamanders are, are, are disjunct. They're distinct from the rest of the continent. And so they're separated from the rest of the continent by the Sierra Nevada to the east up here in this, in this image. And then the Great Basin Desert that goes out to the, to the Rocky Mountains. And then from the Rockies all the way to the East Coast, there's other kinds of tiger salamanders, other species. But our tiger salamander is very restricted. It's genetically extremely unique. And so it's classified as its own species in the California NC or the California tiger salamander. And this just shows you sort of roughly where it occurs in the state. The purple is more or less its range. It's not as continuous as it looks there. It's really broken up more, but, um, but that gives you a sense of it. And another thing about the California tiger salamander is that uh, it is listed and has been listed since around 2000 um, under the US Endangered Species Act. And that's because range-wide it's in really bad trouble. And it's listed in three different, what are called in the jargon, distinct population segments or DPSs. So there's an isolated set of populations up here in Sonoma County, up in the wine country. That's listed as an endangered distinct population segment, the highest level of endangerment that we, we have under the US Endangered Species Act. There's a distinct population segment, which will be what we're talking about today down here in Santa Barbara County, also very isolated, very distinct, um, also listed as endangered. And then there's this central distinct population segment, which is everything else. And it's in the Great Central Valley from Yolo County, um, where, where I used to live um, up, up around Davis. It comes down uh, to about the level of Visalia and then sort of through the Bay Area and down through the intercoast range. That's the Salinas Valley. They're, they're sort of sprinkled in through there. And that's the central distinct population segment. And it's listed as threatened, which is a, a lesser level of endangerment than Sonoma and Santa Barbara. So there's our kind of ge geographical and conservation context. So in terms of the biology of these things, um, tiger salamanders, like a lot of different amphibians, not all, but, but many amphibians, um, they have what's called a biphasic life cycle. So they have two phases. They have a larval phase or tadpole or polywog, and then they have an adult phase. And, and this for California, this is sort of quintessential California tiger salamander breeding habitat. This pool is called a vernal pool. And these are pools that fill up in the winter rains in our Mediterranean climate and then they dry up in the summer. And when they fill in the winter, if they fill in the winter, this winter they're not filling very much, but when they fill, the tiger salamanders actually live out here in the uplands surrounding the area. And they, they live underground in, in burrows, in, in um, rodent burrows. And when it rains, only when it rains and only at night, they come out of those burrows and they migrate to these pools, which is where they lay their eggs and, and have their babies. So there's a tiger salamander coming out of its burrow. It would be at night, not in the daytime. Um, and what they do is they migrate down to the pools, they mate, they lay their eggs, the eggs hatch, and they turn into these aquatic larvae. So this is a larval tiger salamander. And you can see it has these big bushy gills. You can sort of see coming off of the back of it, it has a big tail fin. And they're, they're very, very aquatic. If they're out of the water for more than 30 seconds or a minute, they'll die. And they are oftentimes the top predator in their pools. So they're eating their predators. They eat, you know, crustaceans like fairy shrimp and tadpole shrimp. They eat the tadpoles and tree frogs and toads. Um, they'll eat aquatic insects. They'll just eat anything they can get their hands on. And they're very efficient um, and very effective predators. And then after about three to four months usually, so they kind of come in usually in January to May, the eggs hatch in February, sort of March, April, May, sort of by May, June, they're getting ready to metamorphose. And when they metamorphose, they lose those gills, they lose their tail fin. 
And they come out on a night. Um, sometimes it rains, usually it doesn't. And they come out as a metamorph. And the, the metamorphs have this kind of speckly pattern as opposed to the bright spots that the adults have. And they come out and they find a burrow uh, of, a, of a rodent and they go into it. And they stay there. Um, you know, they may move around at night between burrows when it's raining, um, but they stay on land for four years. And then they come back um, after about four years and repeat the process and then the cycle is complete, okay? And I just wanna emphasize that this is, uh, I mean, this, this is a vernal pool, the largest vernal pool in the state that, that we did a tremendous amount of work in for many, many years up, up by Davis um, called Jepson Prairie. And um, these vernal pools are what we think of as California tiger salamander habitat, and they certainly are. But what you have to remember is that these pools in the winter turn into this in the summer. Okay, they completely dry up. You know, it's 105 degrees out there. It's hot as blazes. And the tiger salamanders are out. They're still out there. They're out on that landscape, but they're down underground in these, in these uh, gopher burrows and ground squirrel burrows. And so I always just like to, to mention this to people. So the reason why tiger salamanders can make it on the landscape to a certain extent is because of these guys. There's a pocket gopher and there's a California ground squirrel. And um, if, if we don't have these kind of engineers who make these burrows and burrow around and, you know, yes, occasionally eat your, your vegetable garden, um, we won't have a whole raft of species. We won't have tiger salamanders, we won't have red-legged frogs, we won't have tree frogs, we won't have toads. There's all kinds of stuff that use these burrows. And so these animals are super important to, to the ecosystems of California. Uh, for small animals that have to get out of the, you know, the heat in the summertime, especially. And like tiger salamanders, I mean, they're underground solid for four years. They, they almost never come up. They come up to feed a few nights a year, but they're basically living down there. And it's, so it's really important. Okay, well, that's, that's a little basics on tiger salamanders and California tiger salamanders writ large. Let's focus in on this Santa Barbara distinct population segment, this little red square down here um, in the North County, right above Point Conception. So the, as I said, it is listed as endangered, the highest level of endangerment under the US Endangered Species Act. And the folks who manage it, which is the US Fish and Wildlife Service, the Ventura Field Office is the lead, the lead for the US Fish and Wildlife Service on the salamanders. They manage it as these six, what they call meta populations. Okay, so this is just a blow up of this map. And you can see there are these kind of six blobs of habitat and the known ponds on those six blobs of habitat are, um, are, are shown on this. And that's it, that's the entire range. You can see down here, this is about 20 miles by 20 miles. Okay, that is an exceedingly small range. And within it, there's a rather small number of, of, of breeding ponds. And that's kind of, that's it for our, for our local distinct population segment. Um, every year, the US Fish and Wildlife Service um, does what they, what they call the, the Santa Barbara, the CTS Roundup. And a bunch of us always participate in this. Um, Rachel Henry, so, who some of you might know, fantastic biologist with the service, uh, runs the Roundup every year. And, and she has managed to put together access to most of the breeding ponds that occur, that, that exist um, where either CTS are known to occupy them or at least they might occupy them uh, in the entire distinct population segment in all of Santa Barbara County. And usually over one or two days, a bunch of us, we're all volunteers. We, you know, we, recon or we convene um, and Rachel assigns us out to different properties. You know, she buys a couple dozen donuts for us and, we, and off we go and we sample ponds, okay? And I'm just showing you data for 2017 and 2019 that Rachel just shared with me. So here's the one, two, three, four, five of the six meta populations. The, the sixth one almost doesn't have any ponds. Um, 
that were sampled in 2017 and 19. And this just shows you, so in West Santa Maria, it's just kind of going from North to South. In West Santa Maria, there are 19 known sites that were visited both years. And in 2017, two of them had larval tiger salamander syndrome. So two of them had successful breeding. In 2019, five of them did. Okay, and you can sort of go across all of them like this. Um, and what you see is that, you know, there's known to be about 80 total breeding sites in the whole range of this thing. And, and you know, I, I've always sort of considered it more or less to be a separate species. Well, it's got about 80 ponds. That's not a lot of ponds. What's really distressing is that in one year, 2017, only 18 of those were, were produced viable salamanders. 2019 was a little better with 27 because it was a wetter year. And 2018 was so lousy, I'm not reporting it. I think there were three ponds where there was tiger salamander breeding in 2018. It was essentially a bust year for the entire species. And that's, you know, this, is, this just sets the stage for what's going on with these animals, okay? This is not a good situation. Um, the other thing I want to emphasize from this slide is that Purissima, which is down in the south, and, and it's the site of the only conservation mitigation bank, um, uh, a guy named um, uh, Brian Sweeney um, owns it and runs it as a, as a you know, a, a operation that, that brings in money and, and helps preserve salamanders. Um, but Purissima has close to half of the known ponds um, in, in that metapopulation and, and about a third of those are on the bank, okay? And that's gonna be a place where we're doing, we're doing a lot of work and we're gonna talk about a lot in the next few minutes, okay? So keep your eyes on that, that of these metapopulations, Purissima is the one that's got the most ponds, Purissima is the one that in many ways we're really banking on, okay? figuratively and literally. Okay, now I'm gonna talk a bunch about genetics. I do genetics and I do genomics and I use all these big, John mentioned this project that we're doing, but you know, we use a lot of very cutting edge tools um, that, are, that are complicated and stuff. But, but the bottom line on genetics, I think a lot of people, um, have a, a sort of very gut reaction that you know, genetics is kind of like statistics or calculus. It's, it's scary and it's bad and you know, I don't wanna hear about it because um, it's complicated. And you know, at some level it's complicated, but as, as my wife always says, you know, so is your cell phone, but, but you use it all the time. And with genetics, um, I, I just want to kind of emphasize that again, we use genetics all the time in our lives. I mean, how many people I wonder on this call have themselves or have family members who have done 23andMe or Ancestry.com. And you just think about what those for-profit companies can do. You know, you give them a little bit of saliva and they can tell you your ancestry. They can tell you, you know, People can screen databases and find your siblings, you know, even if you don't know they exist. There's amazing things you can do with genetics. And we do it. We do it with ourselves. And by the same token, we can learn amazing things with genetics about animals that are and plants that are, that are just hard to figure out any other way. And those are some of the things I'm going to tell you about. I'm going to try not to emphasize the techniques, and I'm going to try to emphasize what we learned about them. So what can genetics tell us about that we care about with California tiger salamanders in Santa Barbara County? Well, it can tell us about landscape level variation. And, and why is that important? Well, well, there's a general rule in ecology that says that populations that are variable tend to be healthy. They're, they're more resistant to diseases. They don't suffer from inbreeding depression. You know, if you think about it, humans as well as most other, other animals have taboos against close relatives breeding with each other. Well, why? It's because when close relatives breed with each other, the genetic variation in their kids is really low and that allows for the expression of diseases and, and deformities and, and problems that we would rather not have. So we have these taboos that just say you can't 
do that. You know, you know that's against the, the, the rules of society. And, and so with, when we study tiger salamanders, we can ask, well, what does their genetic variation look like? If they're in trouble and their populations are small, sometimes that leads to reduced genetic variation and we can measure that. So it can tell us about variation across a landscape. It can tell us how much they move and where they move and how often they move. It can tell us about genetic variation within, within sites or within ponds with the idea that more is better and less is bad. And it can tell us through some tricks that I won't go into, how many individuals actually came in to breed that year. And that's a real, that's a hard thing to figure out. I mean, we've done it at the Pyrrhus in the bank, but generally that's a very hard thing to do. And it's actually pretty easy to do with genetics. So those are just a few of the things. So let's, let's dig in a little bit on the genetics. And so here we are back again in Santa Barbara County. And here's our six distinct population segments, okay? And the samples that, that we have. Um, so we have a total of 471 individual tiger salamanders. We didn't kill them. What we do is we, we use a big net and we sand up a larva and snip off the end of its tail. And just from that little tail tip, we can extract DNA and, and learn about its genetics. And then we let the larva go and salamanders are really good at regrowing um, bits of them that they lose. And, and we've done experiments to show that it doesn't really hurt them. I'm not sure it hurts, but, but, but they survive just fine. So we have 471 individuals collected from 1986 to 2017, actually up to 2019 now. Um, so I've been doing this for a long time from 61 localities. And remember there's a total of about 80. So, so we have most of the range covered, okay? And we can look at this in a couple of different ways. Um, this is a big, fancy, complicated genetic data set. Um, in the old days, meaning five, six, seven years ago, um, I would have been really proud if I got up here and told you, wow, we're studying these things and we have 20 genes. Well, now we have 5,000 genes. And for this big project I'm doing across California with 200 species, we're doing the whole genome. So it's 3 billion markers. But for this, we have about 5,000 genes, which trust me is a, is a good number. And what we can do is take all those individuals, those 471 individuals from all across the range uh, in Santa Barbara County. And one thing we can do is we can, we can sort of look at, at who's similar to each other and who's different from each other. And the way this, this principal component analysis works is simply to say each one of these little dots is a salamander, okay? And we've measured 5,000 genes on it. And if you're close together, it means you're genetically really similar. You're closely related, okay? And if you're far apart, you're, you're less closely related. And what you can see, I've color coded these to be the same color coding as the metapopulations. And you can see that, you know, the pink ones over here from that metapopulation, they all kind of hang together. Um, and then the red ones from over here, they all kind of hang together. The blue ones split with the northern ones up here going with these guys, that's these, and the southern ones here going with the more southerly ones. And then the others kind of cluster together as well. So what it says is, is that these metapopulations actually have some genetic reality, okay, based on a very, very large genetic data set. So that's kind of cool. It says that the metapopulations, which were drawn just based on geography, also reflect genetic similarities and differences. And since each one of those metapopulations is a separate conservation unit, um, that's good because it means we're, we're conserving the major units within the species. The other thing that I'll just point out is that the, the, the main axis of variation is, is this, the, the y-axis over here. And there's really sort of two groups along the y, whoopsie, along the y-axis. This northern group, which is these guys, and then this southern group, which is these guys over here, okay? And we're gonna come back to that in a bit. So that's kind of what the genetics on the landscape tells us. We can also use this genetic data to just say how much genetic variation is in each one of those salamanders, each one of those 471 salamanders. And we can sort of look at them individually and then we can average them and we can say, well, how does that compare to, to other species? And there's, you know, this is from a review that was done a few years ago. Um, 
And it just shows a plot of this is, this is just your genetic variation for a species, okay? And just, it's on a scale, don't worry about it. Um, and, it and it shows a whole bunch of different species and they're ranked um, from low genetic variation over here to high over here. So humans are F, they're, they're kind of in the middle. You know, that's how much genetic variation they have. And, and the Santa Barbara, California tiger salamander is rock bottom. Okay, it is in fact, has the second lowest genetic variation recorded of any species from the wild, okay? And when your genetic variation gets that low, it means you're really inbred, you could be suffering from inbreeding depression, it's bad news, okay? So this is something else we've learned from that genetic data is that we've got a real warning sign here. It doesn't say they're, they're they're inbred and dying, but it says they very likely might be, okay? And this is down, like I said, really low. Um, the other thing we learn about genetic variation um, when we think about it in terms of the metapopulations, so, so the y-axis here is just, is just how variable, variable you are at the metapopulation level average across all those individuals. And the Northern ones are up here, the Southern ones are down here. And this one is Purissima. That's the one where most of the ponds are, right? And where most of the healthy or most of the populations are. And what you can see is that the Northern ones have more variation than the Southern ones do. And Purissima is pretty darn low, okay? Its value is, is a lot lower than the, than the ones further to the North, okay? And that again is gonna be important. One final thing I believe from this sort of survey of genetic variation across the, the um, Santa Barbara population is we can, we can estimate population sizes. Now in genetics, we do this, um, we, we don't estimate the census population size, which is what it sounds like. That's how many actual adults came into breed. We measure something called the effective population size or the genetic population size. It's usually a bit lower than, than the census size. It might be you know, a half or a quarter of the census size, but, but, but it, it, it scales with the census size. And so it gives us an indication of how many individuals are out there. And this shows you for however many populations that is across all the metapopulations, where each one of these is the average for a pond from all the larvae from the pond, the effective population sizes. And, and these, are, these are real numbers, so that's 10. Okay, so I don't, I didn't put a line in there, but you know, the average there is, is like four. Okay. That, that means, you know, if it's double or triple that, maybe, I mean, that, that means that a breeding population of one of these ponds, most of which don't breed every year, is, is down around 10 or 15 individuals, if this is correct. I mean, these are tiny, tiny, tiny numbers. Okay, and that is uniform across the entire population and across all the ponds. There's a couple of outliers that are high, but you know, you know, they're high, they're 20. And they have these giant error bars on them, so we don't even believe them very much. Um, and, and so this again just says that that at least from a genetic point of view, these populations are tiny and again a big source of worry. And that's across the whole distinct population segment of Santa Barbara County. So take a quick breather. What, do we, what have we learned so far? Santa Barbara tiger salamanders are distinct and they're isolated. Um, there are very few total ponds known for breeding, something on the order of, of 80 or so. Um, they have extremely low genetic diversity. Um, they have extremely small population sizes, at least measured by genetics. So it sets a stage for a situation where we don't have very many ponds, May, most years, they don't all produce kids. The number of individuals at those ponds is vanishingly small. It just doesn't look good, okay? So what we wanted to do then was to, to do some field ecological work, more natural history kind of stuff, the sort of thing you might be more used to, to say, well, are these genetic inferences that we're making sort of telling the truth, okay? Um, can we confirm these with genetics, with field studies? And to do that, we worked, um, um, Brian Sweeney, uh, you know, graciously uh, gave us permission to work at the Lock Purissima Conservation Bank. It's about a 3000 acre property in the Purissima Hills. And 
For four years, we worked there. There are 10 ponds that we worked with across that, that area. And we set up a, a program. We did it every year, like I say, for four years. To, and our goal was to trap, actually live trap, every California tiger salamander that bred in every one of those ponds. And this is the heart and soul of the Purissima metapopulation. Figure out how many are breeding, how many breeding adults there are, and how much they move around. Okay, and so how did we do that? Well, here's, here's our, one of our field crews, and this is out on the Purissima Bank. These are all artificial ponds, they're all cattle ponds. And this is, it's, it's cold, it's miserable. They only come out when it rains. So you're out there in the rain and the blowing wind, taking notes, catching salamanders. This was all done by volunteer crews of people. There's Chris Searcy, um, who was a big part of, of this project. And every one of these people did it for exactly one reason. And that's because of this. That's a, that's a gravid or a pregnant female California tiger salamander. And we've marked her and we're studying her. And every one of these people is committed to trying to improve the lot of these animals by, by putting in all this hard work. Um, it's really quite inspirational. As I said, people um, are important in this and I like to try to introduce them at the right time. This is, this is Sonia uh, Wisniewska. Um, Sonia is a landowner. She owns the property immediately to, at the base of the Purissima Bank um, on Gypsy Canyon Road. And Sonia, uh, for reasons I've never been quite clear about, Sonia has been the most amazing partner imaginable. Sonia has opened up her home to me and the students who work with me. Sonia has loaned us trucks. Sonia has loaned us you know, her, her gator um, every day for months. Sonia has done all of this. She doesn't need to, she doesn't get anything out of it. She does it for one reason, I think. And it's because she's a real environmentalist, a real committed person who believes in Santa Barbara County and believes in the environment. And she has literally made this whole project possible. So I can't thank Sonia enough. Um, another individual who's worked for three out of the four years, I, think, I hope that's right, uh, is this guy, David Dubois. Um, he's a, a biological consultant now, uh, working primarily out of San Luis Obispo County. Um, an amazing person, ran the program for two years, has just been, has just been a phenomenal, phenomenal addition uh, to the program. He also happens to be my nephew, but that, that doesn't matter. Um, and and he's, he's been just, again, sort of the heart and soul of the whole thing. Um, and here's uh, David and, and one of our field crews with a whole bunch of the traps that we use and Sonia's gator, um, which she, like I say, just let us use, you know, provided the diesel and, you know, just amazing, you know, every day for weeks and weeks and weeks on end for years. So thank you to one and all. So how do we do this work? Well, what we do is we use these minnow traps. Okay, you can, you can see them there, there's a whole stack of them. And we go out and we, we, these minnow traps have a little funnel at each end of them and, the, and fishes, minnows, and also tiger salamanders go into them. We put floats on them so that, so that um, they can't sink and drown the salamanders because the salamanders breathe through lungs. And we, um, put them out in the ponds. So here's a pond and you can see ding, 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 ding. Those are the minnow traps and we tie them off so that they, they're sort of tethered because what's gonna happen is, is that a big rain's gonna come in and the, the depth of this pond is gonna increase by a foot. And so we wanna keep everything tethered. The pond's gonna get bigger, but the traps will be out there. And what happens is when the salamanders come out in the rain and they come to the pond and they're all marching around looking the male's looking for, for females and vice versa. And they stumble into the traps. And I mean, you would say, you know, how in the world can this work? How can a salamander be so stupid that, to go into one of these traps? Um, this, here's just another pond that's just starting to fill up where we've put out a bunch more, the second one of the ponds at Purissima. Um, well, the fact is now this pond's, you know, gotten a lot bigger. Um, you go out and you do this first thing in the morning because you have to be very careful about not hurting the animals. You check the trap 
And lo and behold, it's got tiger salamanders in it. And sometimes it has a few, and sometimes it has a bunch. And um, we take each one of those salamanders, we mark it with a, with a little tag called a pit tag that some of you might have a, a positive uh, a transponder that you might have in your dog or cat. We mark it with that, we take a picture of it, we weigh it, we measure it, we sex it, and we let it go. And that gives us a very good sense, and we do it day after day after day, of who's in the pond and how big the populations are. And then we do it year after year, and that tells us how much they move between ponds because we recapture animals that have moved. Rarely, but we do, okay? Um, once again, Sonia's, Sonia's you know, generosity, I just can't sort of emphasize enough how important it's been for us. So what have we learned from this four years of data? Well, I've got three years of it here, and I just wanted to share this with you um, just to give you a kind of a sketch of where these things work. So, um, and Chris Searcy pulled this part of it together for us. Um, so this is organized in, in three different ways. So one is you can, you can take the, the mean or the average of all three years of every unique salamander that we caught, not a recapture, but every unique animal that we caught. And you can ask, um, on average, how many males and how many females in a pond, okay? And the answer is that the ponds are male biased, or at least our captures are male biased. And it's around 10, 9.9 .9 males per pond, average over the years, and about you know, six and a half or seven females. Two important points there. One is that if you've got a species that's in trouble, generally you really wish that it would be female biased and not male biased, but it's the opposite here. So that's kind of too bad. And the other is that just like those genetic numbers, these are tiny numbers. So I remember from the genetics, the estimate was three. And I said, usually it's two or three times that. Well, that's exactly what we're seeing, okay? Is that the real numbers, the actual census numbers are well below 10 individuals per pond or, or, or well, sorry, that's, that's, that's not correct, but you know, 17 individuals per pond. But the average is under seven females breeding per pond. The second point is that for 2017, 18 and 19, I didn't include 20 in here. Um, we have, um, you, you can look at the mean, the average number of individuals per pond across the 10 ponds that we, that we worked on at Purissima. And you can see it changes a lot. So 2017 was sort of an okay rain year and there were about seven individuals per pond. 2018, that was that year that the, the roundup, you know, basically got nothing. And there were hardly any adults that came in. Okay, it was, a, it was around four. That, that, that's total adults, okay? 2019 was a better year for rain and that was up around 17. All small numbers. That's the number per pond. And then across the 10 ponds and the three years, you can look at the average number of CTS per pond per year. And it ranged from a low of half a salamander, which presumably means one year there was one and one year there was you know, zero or something like that, up to 29, okay? So even the very, very best ponds don't have very many animals, even in the best years of, of at least these three. And there are populations up, up north in Yolo County and Sonoma County, or Sonoma County, uh, excuse me, Solano County and Monterey County, where we get hundreds, okay? And here, the best we ever saw was 29, okay? So again, not a good scene for the salamanders. So, just as a summary, the field ecology work that we've done at Purissima, which is the best metapopulation left, it's got the most ponds, it's the best hope for the animals, tell us that there's very small populations, there's fewer females than males, that the number that come in to breed successfully varies across years. And I didn't show you this, but there's, there's very little movement between ponds. And the reason that's important is that if a pond's population blinks out, it's, it's gonna take a while for new individuals to come in and repopulate it. So that makes it even more tenuous, okay? And the conclusion is simply that they're in trouble, okay? Um, and this is just to give you sort of a context for other California tiger salamanders. Remember the whole, the whole species is listed under the Endangered Species Act. 
But in terms of those genetic effective population sizes, we have those from a population in Monterey County at Hastings that we've worked on for years, populations in Merced County over by UC Merced that we've worked at, and populations down here in Santa Barbara County. And the healthiest by far is in this biggest block of habitat up by Merced where the effective population sizes are around 30 on average. Over in Monterey County, it's about half that at 17. And the average for Santa Barbara County is five. Okay, so it's, it's again, it's just not a good scene. Um, okay, so a couple more things I wanna talk about and then we can open it up, I hope for questions. So all of this says that the populations are very small. It says that um, they seem to be at great risk and the genetics says there's very, very, very little genetic variation out there. Now, oftentimes what that leads to is inbreeding depression. Okay, when, when populations are small and there's very few individuals, then it means you're often forced to mate with a close relative, sometimes brother, sister matings. That can lead to the expression of deleterious genes or gene copies, and that can lead to inbreeding depression. Okay, and what are the manifestations of inbreeding depression? It's, it's that populations aren't healthy. You see more, if this was a mammal or a human, you'd see more, you know, more, uh, individuals dying in child, you know, more, more infants dying at birth or before birth, you'd see more spontaneous abortions, you'd see more just sort of, you know, lower health um, and vigor of the, of the individuals that, that do survive. And the question is, we can, we can measure that low genetic variation, but what we want to know is, is that, is that leading to this inbreeding depression for the Santa Barbara CTS? And if it is, what can we do about it? You know, it's no good to just study it. We, we've got to do something about it. And so this is where um, the next hero in my, in my group comes in, Aaron Toffelmeyer, who I mentioned and who is on the line, I hope, um, and can hopefully join us in the Q&A. And Aaron did all the genetics work that I've talked about. Um, she's contributed to, to the field work. And then she did this amazing experiment that we did a couple of years ago to ask, are the Santa Barbara tiger salamanders, especially the Picrissima ones, inbred? And are they showing inbreeding depression? Okay. And so the way she did it was with these 300 gallon, they're cattle tanks. These are the things that you put out on your, on your ranch for, for your cattle to drink from. And you can turn this into basically a little experimental pond. Okay. You, you stock it with invertebrates. It becomes a very healthy little pond community. And then you can put tiger salamanders larvae in them and you can ask, how do they do? Okay, do they, do they survive? Do they grow? Can they feed? Are they, are they healthy? And the experiment that, that we did was we took each one of those 10 ponds from the Purissima bank and pulled about 50, 60 eggs from each of them. So, you know, I guess on average 67.9 eggs from each of them. And just put those eggs in a little, floating bucket, you can see one right there. So you took the eggs, this is on a, on a minnow trap. You take the eggs, there's a tiger salamander egg. You take them off and you gently put them in a bucket. And we did that for each of the 10 ponds at Purissima. Now that's a total of 679 eggs. And it turns out one female lays about 700 eggs. So this is the total complement of eggs from only one female. So it's not a big hit on the population. But it's a lot of individuals that we can put out in these in these uh, in, in these 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 acosms, these these pools, and then as a positive control, we went up to Merced County. Okay, so so that's up here, right? We went up to Merced County, which has the highest genetic effective population sizes, and we grabbed um, 145 eggs from two different ponds in Merced County, and those were our positive controls. Those are the ones that we think at least for, tiger sal for California tiger salamanders are the healthiest that we have. And we raised them up or she raised them up and to try to answer the question, is there inbreeding depression? And we looked at that in three different parts of the life history of the salamanders. So the first is egg survival, okay? You've got, you, you out and you collect 50 or 60 eggs and you put them in a bucket and you say, how many of them hatch, okay? And here the blue is Santa Barbara. 
And the egg success, the egg hatch rate was you know, a little over 50%. So about half hatched and half didn't. You go over in a Merced County and the control and it's 80%, okay, 77.9. Um, so in terms of do those eggs even hatch, Santa Barbara's way behind, okay? Well, um, what about given that they hatch, they, how many survive to metamorphosis? And we did this in sort of two different ways, one at a, at a reasonably um, sort of low density and one at a high density, but in both cases, the controls from Merced County survived a whole lot better than, this, than the Santa Barbara ones. So more of them die as eggs, given that they live, more of them die as larvae. So here, the Santa Barbara ones, about a third of the ones that did hatch survived the larval phase, whereas in the controls, it was, it was well over 50%. And then you can also say, how big were they when they metamorphosed? How big were they when they turned into a young salamander that's gonna go out on land? And we've done, Chris Searcy in particular has done a ton of work showing that if you, if you metamorphose at a big size, you have a way, way, way better survival rate than if you metamorphose at a small size. And here, once again, the, the Santa Barbara ones um, were way lower, they were way smaller at metamorphosis than, than, the, uh, than the Merced County ones were, okay? And if you, okay, um, okay. Um, and the bottom line on this is that from egg to metamorphosis, the non-inbred CTS from Merced County had 400%, so four times greater survival and were bigger than the inbred Santa Barbara CTS. So I would say that's pretty compelling evidence that they're inbred and they're suffering from inbreeding depression. So that brings us up to the present. And the question is, what do we do about it? You know, I mean, the, the implication would be if we just leave this alone, they're all just gonna die because they're all inbred and they are not going to survive on their own. So we need some kind of intervention if we wanna keep this unique element, this unique part of the Santa Barbara ecology, um, you know, in the, in the game, if we wanna keep them from going extinct. So what do we do? Well, what, what we're proposing, and the US Fish and Wildlife Service is, is totally on board with this, is to recreate some of that diversity, some of that genetic diversity that's been lost in the California tiger salamators. And the way we want to do that, so here's again our six metapopulations. And remember the ones up in the north, you know, Santa Maria, were, are, are the most genetically variable. And they're also the most different from the ones down here. Purissima has the most ponds and the most habitat. Up north has the most genetic, vari genetic variation. And so what we literally want to do, and we, we have a couple of grants in to, to do this. Um, another uh, young scientist in my lab, Robert Cooper, who is <clears throat> just finishing up his PhD is hoping to do this uh, for some postdoctoral work if we get funded. And what we want to do is go actually up here, catch some animals, mate them with animals from down here in Purissima, raise them up in those cattle tanks, and then put them back out. And, and the, the, so here's, here's the design, right? The proposed plan of action. We're gonna take animals up here from West Santa Maria, which has the greatest level of genetic variation, actually got trap animals, put them in those pools, mate them with animals from Purissima, which have much lower levels of variation and which are different. They're, they're different from each other. So we're gonna mate them that should lead to an enhanced level of genetic variation. And then we're gonna raise them in the mesocosms up to metamorphosis because even if they're healthy, most larvae die. And this way we'll raise up and, and we think we can raise as many larvae up to metamorphosis in one season as would normally be produced in the entire Purissima metapopulation. It's not that many, it's a few hundred animals. And then literally put them back out in the Purissima bank, okay? That's, that's the goal, that's the target. And so it's collect animals, 
adults generate crosses, raise the larvae to metamorphosis in mesocosms, hopefully make nice big fat ones that really do well, release them out in purissima, and then track their success over the next five or 10 years and see how well do they do? Do they come back to breed? When they breed, are they more successful? Do they produce more kids? Is there genetic variation going up? And can we sort of beat this system? And that's, that's something we're really hoping to do in the next couple of years. Um, it's not gonna be this year, but we're hoping for next year. We have grants out um, to fund Robert to be able to do that work. And Erin would also be very much involved with it. So that's what I have to say. Um, and, and I just wanna end it by just saying you know, to everybody, you know, sort of starting with Dick Sage and, and ending tonight with, with, uh, you know, with John and Marjorie and Sonia and everybody else, just thanks for caring about Santa Barbara County and its natural history. It's, uh, it's, it's pretty inspirational, it really is. The fact that you guys have been going for 20 years, the fact that you care so much is really pretty amazing. I also wanna say thanks to the US Fish and Wildlife Service, um, Kat Darst and, and Rachel Henry over in the Ventura Field Office are the best partners anyone could ever imagine. They're fantastic. All the field crews that have helped with all the field work, including the Salamander Roundups and also all our work at Purissima, like I said, they all work for free. And um, you know, it's a lot of hard work, especially for the work out of Purissima. Chris Searcy and his crew, members of my lab, the Salamander Roundup team, and Sonia and the other landowners, owners. And I'll leave it at that. And I know we've covered a lot, but um, I'll take off my screen share. And if there are any questions, um, I'd, I'd love to talk to you if you still have the, have the time and the energy. Well, Brad, thank you very much. That uh, was a wonderful summary of what is rather disturbing news, but it's giving us a lot of hope based on this plan coming forward. Oh. So um, I just wanted to thank you from a lot of us, I'm sure in the society are grateful that you've spent literally decades helping try to save and affect this very imperiled animal. So um, well, thank you. Uh, it means Thanks. a lot here in our community. And uh, it's, it's kind of an emblematic uh, uh, animal in a lot of ways to, to what naturalists are concerned about. Of course, biodiversity in this area yep. uh, represented by this animal struggling to have a, have a foothold. Yep, and it's, you know, it's unique. I mean, it's only there. It's only up in the North County. That's the only place where it exists. And, um, and, and in that sense, you know, it's I, in my mind, um, you know, it's even more important than the, you know, endangered spade foot toads and the endangered red legged frogs because it's only there. And, and that makes it kind of all the more special in many ways. Well, with that, uh, let's go to some chat and uh, Q and A that we have coming in. Some of the <laughs> coming in is uh, comments, but they're always a place of sort of, a, of to launch a question uh, from. So um, I'm going to quickly look here. Yeah, and, and I can I, I can see them in the chat if they're there in the chat. So um, I'd say go ahead and, and okay these on as as much as you'd like to. Sure. Um, okay. okay. Well, so so the 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 first item in the chat is from Mark Holgren. Um, and he says it, it might be good to emphasize that collections are very largely composed of road kills, not live individuals taken. Um, and I'm not sure, Mark, exactly what you mean by that. Um, I mean, most of our samples, virtually all of our samples, all of those hundreds of, of genetic samples, um, as I said, are, are taken sort of non-destructively, certainly non-lethally. So I, myself, when I'm doing field work on them, um, I, I only sample, I mean, in, in terms of genetics, I only take a genetic sample from larvae and I just snip off the very end of their tail. And um, as I said, we've done experiments to show they grow them right back and there's no, there's no measurable decrease in, in the survivorship or health of the animals. Um, in terms of museum specimens and samples, um, certainly most of the ones that are in museums like the Santa Barbara Natural History Museum. Um, I mean, in the old days, you know, when I was an undergrad at Berkeley, 
people would go out and collect them and, you know, as, as living individuals and bring them in. Now, certainly since they've been listed, nobody does that. Um, and they're only, they're only, uh, they're only collected as, as road kills, as you say. Um, and, and even picking up those road kills is really important. It shows us where they're dying. It shows us, you know, at least one source of mortality, which is roads. Um, and it's a source of information. You know, you, if you get those road kills and put them into museums, um, you know, even if they're kind of mushed up and not in great shape, um, usually you can tell what sex it is. You know, the night that they moved because that's when they got run over. You can, you can tell if they're in breeding condition or not. There's a lot of things you can tell from those. So they're, they're very, very important for tigers as well as a lot of other organisms. Um, so, that's, and that's, so it certainly is true now that you know, nobody's collecting adults and putting them in museums anymore, um, which I think is a very good thing. You know, I, I, I never have. And, and I think it's, a, it's great that, that that's, that's really a thing of the past. Um, Dennis Beebe, says, I missed your lecture 20 years ago. Can you summarize then and now? Well, there's a, <laughs> there's an easy task. Um, so of, of course I actually did go back and look um, to see if I had the talk that I gave 20 years ago, but, but of course it was pre-PowerPoint. And so it means I was using slides, remember them and carousels and stuff. Um, and so I don't actually, you know, remember exactly what I talked about. Um, back then, we had some extremely rudimentary genetic data. We had like one gene, it's called a mitochondrial DNA gene, um, that we had studied in tiger salamanders across their range. Now that gene showed that Santa Barbara tiger salamanders were very distinct. It also showed that they had very low levels of genetic variation. So I think we have confirmed that you know, and, and feel much, much, much more comfortable about that. All of the other genetics work, um, no one, 20 years ago, nobody dreamed we'd be able to do this kind of stuff. Um, and this is just, nobody dreamed it. I, I uh, um, you know, I, I, I always say that, um, that in 2014, I published a paper, which was the first whole genome of, of, of a turtle, it was a painted turtle. So that work was done in 2012 and 2013. So not that long ago. Um, and um, that turtle cost about $2 million to sequence its genome. And we're now doing the Western pond turtles and lots of other turtles, the one that you can see behind me. And we can do one for about $200. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the change over less than a decade. And so the whole world of all this genomic stuff has just exploded in a really good way. Um, so a lot of the genetics work we didn't know about, no one had ever done a real field study, no one had ever trapped them, no one knew anything about their population sizes. Um, so, so back then, you know, really what we knew is just, we knew that they weren't in very many ponds. We knew that properties were transitioning from cattle ranching, which had been the sort of historic use of a lot of those properties and which maintained ponds and maintained grasslands for the salamanders. And they were transitioning into both suburban developments like the expansion of Santa Maria um, and also, you know, row crops, you know, gladiolas was a big deal um, and, and grape, you know, vineyard expansion was a big deal. So we knew those things were happening, but we didn't know what the populations were like. And, um, and so um, that really motivated all of this work that, that we've done on them and, um, and, and motivated things like the Roundup every year that the Fish and Wildlife Service does to be able to start tracking that and getting a sense of what's, you know, what the real population biology of them is. So, so I, think, I think the answer was, is in many ways, Dennis, is that 20 years ago, um, we knew they didn't have very many ponds. We knew those ponds weren't always occupied. We knew that the habitat in the North County was transitioning over from cattle grazing to other uses. We knew the salamanders were in trouble. We didn't know how badly, we didn't know any ecological details, um, but we just knew there was 
trouble. Now we know an awful lot of details. And I, and I, you know, I, I think I can honestly say between this work and all the other work we've done in the rest of the county uh, and the rest of the state um, that, that we probably know at this point more about the basic population biology of California tiger salamanders than any other species of amphibian in the US. I mean, there, there might be one, one or two others that, that, are, that, that could give it a, a run for its money, but, but I don't think so. I, th I think it may be the best known species now in the US. And so we've learned a lot. Um, um, Mark comes back again, Brad, have the same forces that led to endemism, endemism meaning, you know, locally restricted populations, as I'm sure you guys all know, to endemism in Santa Barbara CTS also fostered endemism in other amphibians and reptiles, other vertebrates. And um, that is a very good question and a very interesting question. So the, that, that part of the uh, Santa Barbara County, just you know the, the sort of flat land um, in the north part of the county and inland a bit, in fact, is, is, is sort of biogeographically a really interesting area for a lot of things. So um, we've, we've done uh, with another student in the lab, um, we've just finished up a series of studies on Western spadefoots, spadefoot toads, and which are a candidate for listing under the Endangered Species Act. And it turns out that spadefoots so tiger salamanders come down to the transverse ranges, basically the Tachpes, and then stop um, and don't go south and never have. Spadefoots are down south. They're, they're down here. They used to be in LA County. They still are, but, but, but they're in you know, Ventura County and um, down to down San Diego County. And then they're also from Santa Barbara County North. Um, and there's a big distinction, a big break genetically between the ones in the south and the north. And within the ones in the north, Santa Barbara goes with the ones in the north, so north of the mountains, but Santa Barbara is a distinct third group within spadefoots. It's not as distinct as it is in, in tiger salamanders, but it's a genetically very isolated population. Um, in them, um, the red-legged frogs in Santa Barbara County, um, there is some evidence that they are genetically distinct from the other um, populations of California red-legged frog, of Ranadritonii, um, going further north. Um, there are others, um, other examples of it. And that, that, that patch of the North County that's kind of flat and inland is, um, it, it does seem to be at least a, a modest hotbed of endemism. And I, I honestly don't know the invertebrate literature um, uh, and biodiversity well enough to know there's, um, there's a few plants that are um, endemics just in that part of the county. Um, so, so I think the answer is yes, it's not, it's, it's not you know, a gigantically striking one, but it certainly is a multi-species issue that reflects the, the sort of long-term stability of that part of the county, um, given all the plate tectonics and, and movement that's happened around. Um, Bianca Ryans asks, how close are the ponds to each other inside the metapopulation? Is there any way to connect them to increase flow? Um, well, I, I can answer this. I'd, I'd kind of love to, um, <clears throat> I'd love to turn this over to Erin if I could, but I'm not sure we're gonna be able to do that. Um, just because she's done some really, some really interesting work on uh, Bianca on, on the, the importance of ponds being in close proximity to each other. So she's looked at that pretty closely um, across the, the entire um, Santa Barbara distinct population segment. So for example, um, in Purissima, um, the ponds are anywhere from uh, they're anywhere from about 600 meters apart to about, a, well, you know, across the whole thing. It's a, a couple of kilometers, so a mile and a half. Um, and one of the things we've learned from 
marking those salamanders and then seeing where they show up the next year, if they breed again the next year, is that um, they, the, the sort of maximum distance we've seen them move is about 600 meters, so about 600 yards, okay, between ponds. Now that's, you know, it's not a huge sample size. Um, they probably go a little further than that, but that's, so what it seems to be is, is that they'll move between ponds on adjacent um, years, maybe, you know, three, four, five, six, 700 meters from other work we've done, we've shown that they'll go out to, you know, a couple of kilometers, so to a mile and a half or so. And, um, and, and so they, they, they can move around. <clears throat> the ponds, historically, the way that vernal pools were organized is that they were sort of clustered usually. So you get the right soils and you get the, you know, the right flatness and the clay and the soil and that sort of stuff. And you get a patch of that and you'll get a bunch of vernal pools all within, you know. I turned off your video. I can't turn it back on, but don't turn it back on. It's fine. I can. Okay. Sure. Um, anyhow, you get, you, get a, you get a bunch of pools that are, that are all sort of right near each other. And what it really seems to be, and maybe this is getting at your question a little bit, Bianca, is that... Um, the more you have these clusters of pools, the healthier the whole, the healthier each pool within the cluster is. And Erin has showed that really nicely with some of her work. So, so they, they sort of you know, feed off of each other in a sense, they, they mutually benefit each other. And that's, I think that's just because if, if you sort of think about it, um, if individuals are moving between those, those pools you know, across years, it, it, the whole thing sort of functions a little bit more like one big pool. And that means you get sort of a bigger population. And also if, if one of the pools or one of the ponds collapses for some reason, something goes wrong with it, a predator gets in there and eats everybody, it means that the next year individuals can come in and repopulate it. That's something called metapopulation dynamics. And, um, and, and so, increasing the um, more pools within proximity of each other is a very important thing to do. Um, there's, there's no real, and, and the way to connect them to increase the flow, the movement of individuals is literally to build more ponds. And, and again, a student in my lab, Robert Cooper, has built experimental ponds um, up at Fort Ord in, in Monterey County that he's used over the last few years for tiger salamander breeding experiments. And he's an expert at building ponds and you can build ponds and the amphibians use them. They use them right away. They love them. We've done a, a project exactly with that in mind that again, that Robert was our lead on uh, down in Orange County um, with a group called the Natural Communities Coalition building building breeding ponds for uh, Western Spadefoots. And they built, uh, I don't remember how many, a dozen or so um, artificial breeding ponds. And the first year, Spadefoots went in and bred in them. So, so these ponds work and they can really increase that connectivity that you're talking about. Okay, um, oh God, there's a bunch of them. Okay, I'm gonna have to make it a little, little quicker here. Um, Christopher Karsten says, I would put this into Q&A, but maybe chat would be better. I don't know if there's a difference. Although your second PCA axis, okay, explained a lot less of the vari variation. The population still sorted out pretty cleanly across it. Out of curiosity, what did the second axis, what did the second axis load the highest with? So, so remember, okay, the, this is that plot that I showed where you know, I said the, the Northern populations and the Southern ones kind of clustered together, but you could see each one of them. So, um, I mean, remember the only data that's going into that PCA is, is genetic variation, okay? And so, I mean, there, we don't look at specific genes, but what does happen um, is maybe partly to your point, Christopher, is that um, as you walk through the different principal components, the, the second, the first one explained about 15% of the variance of the total genetic variation in the data set. So that's a lot. The second was about three or four. The next one is about 2%. And then, you know, one and a half percent, it gets smaller and smaller. 
by definition. That's how PCAs work, as I'm sure you know. Um, but what just happens is, is that individual metapopulations and then sometimes individual clusters of ponds within metapopulations just break out and separate from the rest of the pack as you walk through those, those different PCAs. So, um, and it, it just, eventually you get down to a level of granularity where, where in many cases you can, you can see individual ponds being distinct from each other or close or very close together suites of ponds. Okay, back to um, Mark again. Um, he says, I'm speaking of the majority of specimens in the UCSB um, cyber museum collections. That's in terms of the road kills and fair enough. Um, absolutely, yep. Um, Laura Baldwin says, thank you, Dr. Schaefer um, or Brad, as I like to be called. Um, for this wonderful work. Do you know if there may be other unknown populations of CTS in Santa Barbara County? Well, of course, Laura, not to be a, not to be a jerk, but um, you know, if they're unknown, then I don't know about them. Um, I guess that goes without saying. Um, and, and for that, you know, I don't know the landscape as well as, you know, if you know some of the other people up there who really know the landscape of that part of the county well. Sam Sweet certainly does, Larry Hunt, um, you know, some folks who, who really are out there all the time. Um, I think, you know, I know there are a few. There are, there are certainly landowners who won't let, won't let biologists on their property. Um, and so, you know, those ponds haven't been able to be, to be sampled. Um, but, you know, my understanding is that this is most of them. It's certainly most of the big ones. Um, I don't think there's any really, and, and remember something I didn't mention, I probably should have, um, is that if a pond is permanent, then almost always what eventually happens is it gets fishes and it, and it gets crayfish. So, you know, people put fish in them. So you get, they're all non-native fish, but you know, you get sunfish and other centrarchids, largemouth bass and stuff like that. Um, or invasive crayfish get into them and bullfrogs get into them. And when that happens, you lose the native amphibians. They, um, so I have literally, I think, I mean, I've seen up thousands and thousands of ponds and I've seen up hundreds of thousands of tiger salamander larvae in my life. And I've never gotten one in a pond with a catfish or, or a sunfish. They, they just, they, they eat them all. Um, in other parts of the country, people use tiger salamander larvae as fishing bait or water dogs. And it's because they're great bait, because I guess I'm not a fisherman, but, but um, I guess predatory fishes really like them. And they just, so, so in terms of ponds, you can't have ponds that are too big and too deep because they become permanent. And then eventually they, they fill up with, with non-native predators. And I think in terms of other ponds, you know, I think most of them are pretty well nailed. Um, okay, let's move on here. Huh, Robert Fisher says, um, Robert Fisher is a, uh, is a biologist with the USGS down in San Diego County. Uh, he said, you showed dots for invasive species on one map, but didn't mention them. Can you explain this issue? I certainly can, Dr. Fisher. Um, so uh, again, I just, to simplify it, I didn't wanna bring this up, but there's um, a major issue up further north in the central DPS is that non-native tiger salamators, so a different species of tiger salamator, closely related and different species has been introduced. Tens of thousands of them were introduced into, into um, central Monterey County in the Salinas Valley back in the 1950s. And they hybridize with native tiger salamanders. And so that has been a really big problem. And of course, we've studied that extensively with genetics because we can track the different gene pools of the two different species and the hybrids. And there's a whole story there about how the hybrids are much they grow faster, they get bigger, they're much more predatory, and they really replace the natives. And from a conservation point of view, usually you want to keep the native gene pool as opposed to 
a non-native one coming in. And so in Santa Barbara County, um, over by the Lompoc Penitentiary, if you know where that is, um, there was an introduction of these non-native barred tiger salamanders, uh, gosh, I don't know, in the 70s maybe. Um, and we got a sample of those, Sam Sweet helped us get a sample of those and we ran those years ago and they're all pure non-native. And those non-native, so those are the invasives that were on that map, they have been moving east from the Lompoc Penitentiary, which is outside of the native range of the of CTS, of Santa Barbara CTS. But they've 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 moved east and um, are are sort of kind of look like they're kind of coming across Highway 246, if you know it, over towards Purisma and the and the you know the 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 last really good you know set of or okay set of populations left. Um, we have extensively sampled all the ponds, larvae every year. Um, we 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 had evidence of one hybrid um, from a bunch of years ago that that somebody I think it might have been Larry Hunt picked up and sent to us, and it genotyped out as a hybrid between native CTS and the invasive species. And we thought, oh God, you know, it's game over. Um, but we have never found another one. And, um, but they're very close. They're within a few kilometers of each other. So they certainly could. Um, they're coming in from the West and moving East, but they have not yet. So, so far, the answer seems to be that although it feels like a looming danger, there's no big problem from the uh, there's no problem from the invasive, the non-natives yet. Uh, let's see, what else can I say? Um, someone who I don't know, um, Len Fleckenstein says, what factors might, might affect the health of vernal pools? For example, ag fertilizer, precipitation levels, soil erosion, would those factors affect salamander reproduction? Yeah, so, so Len, if that's your name, um, it's a good question. And one of the things, again, I didn't mention because of time, but one of the things that we've noticed out of Purissima um, more than once is that we're out there and we put out our traps and you know, we're, we're marking the adults and, and doing all of that. And they, they'll, they lay eggs on the traps a lot of times. They like to lay eggs on, on you know, plants and the traps are perfectly good for that because um, they're made out of hardware cloth. And so you see the eggs and the eggs are developing and the adults have come in. And then we go back out, we'll be back out there, I hope in, in, in two or three months, if there's any water in any of the ponds to see how the larvae are doing. So get them at the late stage right before they metamorphose. And more than once we've seen it where they've laid eggs and yet when you go out in, in you know, mid-April, there's no larvae, everything has died. And that's one of the things that has made us wonder, well, is it something like fertilizer or is it, you know, cows peeing in the water and, and you know, it, it just gets so intense that nothing can live in it anymore. Um, it doesn't happen all the time. It doesn't happen in every pool. Um, that's part of the reason why we did that experiment that, that Aaron ran where we, we brought, you know, larvae or brought eggs in and asked what was their natural hatch rate compared to genetically healthier populations because we wanted to ask is it a function of the pond or is it a function of the animals and by bringing everybody in in the same conditions the answer seems to be at least in part it's a function of the animals right because they all had the same water and the same food and the same everything um, however we do see this sort of striking example where, you know, or there'll be one larva left in the pond or two larvae left in the pond, you know, and you sane the hell out of it, you sane it and sane it and sane it and sane it and sane it. And you keep catching the same salamander, but, but you know, there's, there's three of them. And so it does seem like there might be something going on also perhaps with the water chemistry, or maybe there's just, you know, the, the clutch or two that were laid in there were very, very inbred and most of them died. And, and separating those two things out has been, has been tricky. Um, 
Next up is Dave Cook. Dave's a, a salamander, California tiger salamander biologist extraordinaire up in Sonoma County. And uh, thanks for, for watching, Dave. Um, Dave says, Brad, is the genetic variation in Santa Barbara sufficient to make North and South breeding useful? A great question. Did you consider crossing breeding Santa Barbara's tigers with other DPSs? And the slide that, that uh, I was gonna show, but again, it was just getting a little too complicated is that what we're actually going to do, assuming we get the funding and can do this project, is we're, we're gonna do a breeding experiment Okay, so, so let me just say the, um, so the US Fish and Wildlife Service manages them as these three distinct population segments, Santa Barbara, Sonoma, where Dave works, and then, and then the central DPS. And part of the mission in that is to try to maintain the integrity of each one of those distinct population segments. Okay, they're, they're evolutionarily, they're very distinct from each other, so try to maintain that integrity. Therefore, they would prefer not to have crosses between DPSs. So between the central, say, and the, and the Santa Barbara. On the other hand, Dave, as you point out, you know, because you're, you're a good biologist and geneticist, um, there's not that much variation left in Santa Barbara. And so even doing Santa Maria and Purissimo, which is as broad, a, as, as wide a cross as you can do, it might not be enough. And so the, the design we have in place is to do that, that broad cross, do a Purissima by Purissima cross. So that's you know what would happen naturally, right? Do a Purissima to Santa Maria cross. That's what is the broadest, widest cross you can do across the Santa Barbara DPS. And then also do a Purissima to Merced, so to the, that healthy population. And the idea is set up a hundred of those mesocosm tanks, put all of those crosses out in those tanks and ask, compared to the Purissima by Purissima cross, do we see an increase in fitness and survivorship or growth or whatever? when we move out to a Santa Maria by Purissima cross, that's a cross that everyone's comfortable with and releasing those animals. So we'd release them no matter what. And then also just as an experiment, do the same cross with Merced. And if that works way, way better, if we see a much bigger increase and we're getting more bang for our buck, then we will rehuddle with the Fish and Wildlife Service and say, okay, well, are we at a point where we need to do that? And if you think about it, you know, that's what people did with Florida panthers, right? They, they, there was a subspecies that was going extinct due to inbreeding depression in Florida. And what did they do? They went to central Texas and they got some other, some other mountain lions or panthers and brought them in and they did those crosses. And, you know, now we have panthers in Florida again. Um, so, so that's the, that's, it, that will be an empirical question, um, presumably not to release those. The, so the, the wide cross with Merced will just be an experiment. Um, but it's a great question. Um, by the AI to me, is hybridization with Tigrinum, with the tiger salamander a risk to this DPS? It is, the only issue is that we now no longer call the barred tiger salamander Invistima tigrinum, which is what you call the bio, we call it Invistima um, mavorsham, or, oh, and you started as mavorsham, sorry. So um, I, I've already answered that from Robert and the answer is yes. Um, okay, Cindy Hitchcock from down in my neck of the woods. Hi, Cindy, says, uh, hi, Brad, nice talk. Um, any idea what the mechanism is underlying the reduction in survivorship to metamorphosis in Santa Barbara? Um, is it reduced prey capture success, assimilation rates? If unknown, we should measure performance. Um, oh, and I'm sorry, it's not Cindy, it's, it's her husband, Bobby Espinosa. Um, so the answer to that, Bobby, is that no, we don't know. You know, I mean, as you well know, you know, these, these eggs, I mean, by the time you see that an egg has died, for example, you know, it's deteriorated and sort of, sort of, you know, bacteria have gotten at it and it's, it's kind of rotted to nothingness. Um, with the larvae, we don't usually find the dead ones in there. 
Um, and so, and so the the source of that mortality is is not quite clear. So, so um, we don't we don't really know. Um, we have done, as I'm sure you know, um, we've measured, you know, performance in tiger salamanders generally, and we certainly could do it with the Santa Barbara ones um, if if we could get permission from the service. Um, you know, we've measured locomotor performance, how fast they swim, and how long they can swim for, and stuff like that. Um, and Robert Cooper has done work looking, looking at heat stress tolerance in, in different tiger salamanders. So we certainly could, and, and, and I think it might well be interesting to know, but I think the real, from a pure conservation point of view, the bottom line is, is will these crosses fix it? And if they will, then great. And then it's, it's almost maybe a little bit more of an academic question. I think of saying, which is still important, of saying, you know, how does how you know what's the underlying mechanism? We got a few more. Can we still keep going, John, or what do you think? We should keep going um, as long as people are happy to hang in there. Of course, the beauty of Zoom is folks can leave the hall quietly. They can. Yes. Um, okay. Share, um, and I thank you, Brad, for because there are uh, more questions, folks. Yeah. And well, let me. Questions in Q and A that uh, probably. Oh, uh, okay. So I'm not seeing all the questions. No, and so at some point I could. Uh, Wait. Okay. Um, um, all right. Well, let me um, let me go. Um, um, there is some duplication and some stuff you've already. I'm, there's some duplication and some stuff I've already talked about, um, uh, Steve. Simpson asks, are alligator lizards and legless lizards endangered? Um, and, and the answer, Steve, is that legless lizards are a species of special concern. Um, the southern alligator lizard, Ogillaria multicarinata, is not listed in any way or endangered. The Panaman alligator lizard um, is a species of special concern. Um, okay, I got a couple more here. Steve Junak, another wonderful, um, sort of collaborator and supporter um, as, a, as a landowner in the region is, asks, hi Steve, asks, are non-native salamanders found in the Lompoc Valley? We've already talked about that. So I'll take a pass on that one on the abyssal abortion barred tiger salamander. Um, um, so, um, there's a question from Dennis about the passing lanes on 246 near Tularosa Road, um, included a massive elevation of the highway. Do you know whether this was done to aid salamander transit under the highway? Um, my understanding of that one, I was not a part of that uh, decision-making, but my understanding of that is that yes, it was. And the, the sort of classic, you know, sad, issue on that is that it that we have some indication we don't have confirmation of it but there's at least sort of some ideas that there are non-native salamanders south of 246 and so assuming that is true the last thing we want to do is open up a tunnel so that they can move north and get into the purissima populations of native cts um, that would just be sort of a you know a true tragedy. Um, but I believe that was a, an underpass uh, a crossing for, for wildlife, including salamanders. Couple more. Um, are most pools in Santa Barbara constructed cattle ponds, or are there still a number of remaining vernal pools throughout the meta populations? Um, and this is asked by Victoria uh, Brunel or Brunel. Um, and Victoria, the answer is, um, to the best of my knowledge, there are still some natural vernal pools left. There's, there's um, a beautiful uh, sort of set of them out by the Santa Maria airport that you might know. Um, there's a lovely um, kind of round one on the, on the west side of the 101 that you can see when you're, when you're driving south, not when you're driving north. Um, there's, there, there are natural vernal pools around. Um, I think it, as with the entire range of the species, um, numerically they're breeding now more in cattle tanks than they are in natural vernal pools. 
just, just because the natural vernal pools are in these big flat expanses and those are what we tend to develop first. So, um, but, but there are still some, but my guess is I, I don't actually have the numbers. My guess would be that a quarter of those 80 are, are natural or a third, something like that. And then Tristan um, says, are there examples of salamander or similar species crossbreeding and translocation projects similar to what's been proposed, <coughs> excuse me, for Santa Barbara CTS? If so, what are the positive and or negative results? Um, the answer to that is, um, there are, I mean, there is a massive unintentional experiment, which is a very wide cross between CTS and barred tiger salamanders, two different species, which are still interfertile. And there, the answer is, is that the hybrids outperform the natives in any way you can think of. They are, they, they grow faster, they grow bigger, they have a bigger clutch size, they survive better, um, they're, they're, you know, depressingly successful salamanders. Um, that's not an experiment anybody did, um, but, it, but it is a result that says that you can make pretty wide crosses and, um, and, and still get a lot of hybrid vigor out of those. Um, otherwise, are there any, you know, I can't think of any offhand, um, but, um, if you, Tristan, if you're, if you're really curious about it, um, look me up, it's Brad Schaefer at UCLA, shoot me an email and I'll see if I can, um, you, know, you know, when I've thought about it a little bit more, um, see if I can round up something. There are crosses that we've done, but they're just kind of lab crosses. Um, in terms of actually doing that experiment, I don't think so. So, okay, that's it on the chat. Um, what do we got with the Q&A, John? And you're muted, I think. Yeah, on the Q&A, we have uh, <coughs> that migrated uh, over to chat. So I think- Okay. Those. And there is one last one- um, Okay. From Chris Berry that might be a good sort of chance to wrap up with. Sure. Uh, uh, do you want me to read that to you? Yeah, if you are. Uh, yeah, yeah, I've got it here and, and Chris writes, so is low genetic diversity the greatest threat to long-term survival of Santa Barbara, the California tiger salamander populations? And how great are the threats of roadkill habitat loss and invasive salaman salamanders comparatively? So. Yeah, um, you know, it's a good question as, you know, as always, it's, it's a hard question. Um, I mean, if, if I had to, you know, if I had to rank them, um, I, I think I would sort of almost rank them in a, in a temporal sense. Um, that is, um, I think, I think in the, in the long term, um, you know, it's probably habitat loss. I mean, they, they have lost so much habitat and, um, you know, there, I mean, there's 80 ponds left, you know, or, or something like that. Um, and most of them are artificial ponds. Some of those artificial ponds hold water, you know, during, you know, across the summer over what years. So they're, they're subject to those predators. There's not native predators getting in. Um, you know, they're, they're kind of living in some pretty marginal areas. And a lot of those, those uh, a, a lot of the, the watersheds from the ponds have been developed or degraded. So I think the pools don't fill up anymore. Um, the, you know, those, those uh, you know, those 80 pools or 77 pools that we do in the Roundup, I mean, every year we check them all, but like in 2018, you know, only 10 of them even had any water in them. And, and that's not just because of drought, that's also just because they, they're, they're, the watersheds in the surrounding areas um, have been sort of so disturbed and they're so isolated and stuff. So I don't know, you know, I think it's, it's, uh, it's pretty hard to, to match them up on the, you know, the, or, or to, to rank them. 
Um, habitat loss is a really, really big one. And I think it was maybe Bianca who said, uh, who asked about building more ponds on those habitats. And I think that would be, you know, a great thing to do. And we've, we've worked out plans with the Fish and Wildlife Service to do that on some properties that I think would increase the kind of carrying capacity of the, of the populations. On the other hand, if we don't get some genetic variation back in, it's not going to matter if there's any habitat. And, and I really do think the experiment that we did, um, you know, it was a pretty well replicated experiment. It was only one year, but it was all 10 of the Purisima ponds with good positive controls. And, you know, and it's striking. 12% I mean, of the eggs we collected from Santa Barbara from, you know, averaged across those 10 ponds, 12% of them made it to metamorphosis and 50% of the ones from Merced County did. And that's a big, big, big difference. You know, that's a huge difference. That's under ideal conditions with everything right. You know, 12% made it, that means 88% of them died. And, you know, that's, if, if that is due to, it, to inbreeding, um, you know, that, that's something that's sort of gotta change. And, you know, if you protect populations, eventually, you know, mutations kick in and you, you start to regenerate genetic variation. But if those populations are small, that's a, you know, it takes a long time. And, and you know, usually it catches up with you before then. And so I would, I would kind of say that I think if we want to keep the animals on the landscape right now, um, I think this sort of genetic rescue approach that, that we're talking about, um, I, I think we've really got to do it. Um, uh, I mean, I think it would be interesting to know why the ones up in, in the North County, you know, the far North, Santa Barbara and Santa Maria um, have maintained more genetic variation. And it may have to do with the fact that there's natural vernal pools up there and that those just maintain healthier, bigger populations. I don't know. Um, but I think, I mean, to my mind, the kind of two-step process is, and this is just me talking, this is certainly not the service or anybody else, um, but I think the two-step process is, is, is first to just try and stabilize what we've got by increasing that genetic variation and seeing if that increases survival rates and we can get the numbers up. And, and then, think about restoring habitat, putting in additional ponds, possibly, you know, working with other, other uh, landowners like, you know, like Brian and Sonia and other people, you know, um, Steve, um, to, to try and get more habitat on the landscape. And it's kind of, I, I sort of view it as a two-step process. And, you know, roadkill, you know, yeah, they get smushed on the road and that's sad, but, but you know, that, that's not gonna take them out. I mean, not unless we increase the road density tremendously in the North County. Um, if the hybrids get in, that's a whole different, or if the non-natives get in and hybridize, that's a whole different game. And I mean, I could give you another lecture because we've studied that, you know, extensively up in, up in Monterey County um, uh, for, for 15, 20 years. And um, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very interesting problem because when, the, when hybridization occurs, you, you, don't lose this, you don't lose salamanders, you just lose native salamanders. You know, the, what you get are hybrid salamanders. And if, if things get bad enough, I mean, look at what we're talking about with a, with a genetic rescue recovery program. If things get bad enough, then I would certainly advocate for saying, go to a different DPS, go to Merced County. And even though we'd kind of lose the genetic integrity of the Santa Barbara ones, we would, we would at least keep, you know, some semblance of that genetic lineage on the ground where it belongs. And you can expand that out and say, well, in the Salinas Valley, where essentially every salamander is a hybrid in the whole Salinas Valley, um, the, you know, they're really healthy salamanders. They're just not quite the right salamanders. <laughs> they're, um, they're hybrids. And, and the really insidious thing about the hybrids is that, you know, with normally with invasive species, 
you know, if you've got whatever invasive eucalyptus or whatever it might be, um, you can go out there and you can at least say, you know, that tree is an invasive tree. I can cut it down and I can try and get rid of it. With a hybrid, you can't, or it's, it's very hard to figure out how to, that hybrid has both native and non-native genes in it, and you can't sort of pull them apart. And so, so, so there's, there's as, as I always say, you know, there's no more good guys left out there because everybody's a hybrid. And, and so that means then you just have to sort of rethink your whole, your whole strategy. Robert Cooper, again, for part of his PhD work is actually looking at whether you can possibly modify the amount of time that ponds hold water and use that as a way of selecting for native genes and selecting against non-native genes and sort of pulling the nativeness back out of the hybrids. Um, that's a, an experiment that's, that's you know, he's just wrapping up right now. We don't quite know the answers to that yet. Um, but, but, you know, so I don't know, the, the hybrids are kind of a separate slippery issue, but there's at least some answer. So I think, I think it's, you know, it's kind of a, I don't know, the, both, both, I think, inbreeding depression and habitat loss are, you know, they've both got to get fixed if we're going to keep them on the landscape. Let's put it that way. Okay. Well, um, Brad, I think we got everyone's questions covered. Thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us tonight. What a great set of questions came in. And I'll say. <laughs> That the, the basic simple one that Dennis Beebe sent was, you know, basically what we've learned in 20 years, a huge amount, and there's still more, more and more to learn and more work to be done. So I think um, we're thrilled to have you back. And let's not wait uh, 20 years. <laughs> program. Since we'll probably both be, you know, long gone at that point. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll, Agreed, and thank you. And thank you to um, all the people who have hung in here for close to two hours. I'm, I'm amazed that you've done that. Um, your, your, uh, your, your tenacity or curiosity or something is, is really pretty astonishing. And, and thank you for, thanks for asking all these great questions and being a, being a great audience. It's really fun. Maybe next time we can do it in person. Let's, thank, let's thank you, Brad. Let's plan on that, yes. Okay. Um, so that we can get together uh, again soon, maybe on another topic as well. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thanks so much, Brad. Good to see you. Okay, good to see you. Take care, you guys, and keep up all okay. the great work with the with the society. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.